Okay, I got some very good advice. The mind can only absorb what the rear end can stand. So I will substitute brevity for brilliance and appreciate everything you've done. That's okay, I got that. Actually, I'll share a story with you before I get down to the prepared remarks. Toward the end of the Second World War, Prime Minister Churchill was approached by a journalist. Churchill was traveling in the northern part of England. And the journalist wanted to ask him a different question. So he looked at me and he said, Mr. Prime Minister, he said, you've lived this incredible life. You've got all this accomplishments. But tell me three things that you've run across in your life that are tough to do. Well, you know, Churchill, he chomped down on his cigar. He looked at me and said, there are three things. First, first, try to climb a ladder when it's leaning towards you. That's tough. He said, second, try and kiss a pretty girl when she's leaning away from you. <laughs> he said, third, try to deliver an after-dinner speech. <laughs> That's what I think. First Lady Corbett, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for taking the time tonight to help these brave and deserving young men and women, and by your support and presence to honor me. The Lasting Legacy Award has afforded the opportunity for me to journey into what were for me uncharted waters of autism and severely emotionally disabled children. I've learned, for instance, that the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported just this past April a 30% increase 30% increase in diagnosis of autism just over the past four years. And the startling statistic, and this really caught my attention, is that one in 68 of all United States children and one in 42 of all male children are found to be suffering from some form of autism spectrum disorder, from mild impairment to severe withdrawal. Theories for this shocking increase range from simply greater awareness, broader definition, stress in pregnancies, to increased exposure to pollution. What is not disputed is that autism preys on our children and grandchildren with frightening and increasing frequency. Your generosity tonight is the way all of us have chosen to light a candle of hope rather than simply curse the darkness. As for the endowment created, I submit, if exposure to one painting, if attendance at one musical or theatrical performance, if one melody made possible by your generosity brings some joy to these young warriors, then your sacrifice of time and money will have been more than worth it. I, I learned something very important working with Mrs. Corbin on the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Even a little money in support of the arts can make a big difference to those involved. There is a limited but very special list of those I want to thank tonight. Included in that circle are those who serve every day on the front line of the autism battle. First to the young men and women who are the students of Green Tree School, back there, whom fate has chosen to test with obstacles and challenges beyond the comprehension of all of us. They are the real honorees tonight and the heroes of this hour. We stand in awe of their courage and accomplishments. On their behalf, I want to thank and I want to acknowledge that your generous donations will make possible a fund to nourish their souls through art therapy at a time when government support is only sufficient to cover basic educational services. My admiration for Trish Wellenbach, the dynamic and determined CEO of Green Tree and her world-class staff knows no bounds, day after day, demonstrating a degree of patience and compassion almost otherworldly. She and the teachers, administrators, and support personnel have never given up on any student in need or missed an opportunity 
to make a difference. To just say thank you simply illustrates the limitations of language. On a more personal note, and I guess I get a little more personal right now, none of what I've been able to accomplish as a lawyer or as a citizen in this great city would have been possible without a supportive, steadfast, and very special group of law partners and colleagues at Dilworth Paxson. It is on their shoulders I have stood for almost 50 years. Without their continuing encouragement, my contribution to Philadelphia's civic and cultural life would not have been possible. Without having the privilege of spending all my years at the firm with one of the finest lawyers and friends I could ask for, Joe Giacobini, I think my life would have been different. Today, the mantle of leadership and vision are in the process of transferred to a new generation led by our chairman, Larry McMichael, and by our new CEO, A.J. Raju. Many things will change. One thing will not. Our firm's respect for the profession we have chosen to serve and to a tradition of excellence we will always maintain. <laughs> Working by our side is our superb staff and support personnel, some of whom are with us tonight, whose talents and energy are what makes the practice of law possible. Not only do we have a law firm, but I have a life. And in many ways, that wouldn't be possible without the support of my assistant, Jen Fan, who's in the room here somewhere. I, I had to, it was important that I ad-lib that sentence, because if I had dictated to Jen, she would have deleted it, and I wouldn't know what happened. I have led a very fortunate and particularly interesting professional life. Three times I've gone from opening a file at the law firm to opening day at a Philadelphia landmark. You've heard about them all. Each now proudly adds to its unique presence in the Philadelphia landscape. Can you imagine that I often spend the mornings at the Barnes Foundation addressing issues of importance surrounded by some of the most beautiful paintings in the world? And then in the afternoon, I can be found in a meeting at the National Constitution Center, working on a problem at the only place in our nation dedicated to increasing America's appreciation of the three most beautiful words in the English language, we the people. In addition, what lawyer in America would turn down the opportunity to help locate and then return to its proper home state original copies of the iconic document that actually contains those essential liberties required by a free people. The first 10 amendments to our Constitution, popularly known as the Bill of Rights. By the way, that sting didn't go as smoothly as some people tend to. <laughs> the first time that the FBI wanted to enlist Joe Torcell and I, we got stuck on the door trying to get away from him. <laughs> but it did work. I've been fortunate to be chairman of a New York Stock Exchange company and served in that capacity in one of Montgomery County's largest companies. The experience taught me important lessons about the loneliness of leadership, the need for collaboration, and the requirement of a unifying theme. I've even, in the course of my life, done some work in the financial area. The most fun one was representing the world-famous bank robber, Willie the Sutton. As a lawyer, I envision my role as counselor keeper of secrets and a steward of other people's burdens. Front and center this evening is a different place in line for me, but be assured that tomorrow I intend to return to the anonymity I so richly deserve and desire. <laughs> Let me continue. What can I say about my Jewish, Lutheran, Italian, Irish, Palestinian, and Indian immediate family? <laughs> First of all, we have expanded the outer limits of the definition of diversity and descri I describe it for what it really is, chaos. <laughs> Sometimes I think the only thing missing at our annual Seder is bagpipes. <laughs> Julia and I are blessed with seven grandchildren from Chelsea to Charlie, and I'm particularly moved tonight to have Stephen, who's behaving himself, Teddy, 
and Chloe all here with me. This is not completely altruistic. It is not too much to hope that having been exposed to their grandfather's accomplishments, that my breakfast request to stop talking and finish eating will carry with it considerably more authority in the future <laughs> than it has in the past. I don't think so. The grace and enthusiasm of Chelsea, my oldest granddaughter, sets a high standard for the next generation, but I am confident they will meet it. My daughters, Allison and Melina, are everything I hoped they would be and more. Their husbands, Samara and Michael, and my son, Tom, are a source of pride and affection. Through them and their children, I hope I, to touch a distant shore called the future, where a word of my advice or an instructive memory may, on occasion, make the difference. I would add to that list that I've been blessed with two brothers, Mickey and John, whose presence and humor are the real blessings that my parents bestowed upon me since birth. My sister-in-laws, Brenda and Joanne, qualify for nothing short of sainthood, having endured <laughs> the two of their husbands all these years. And then there's Julia. Anyone who knows her quickly realizes that her beauty is only the beginning. It is her uncommon common sense and the warmth of her soul that more accurately defines her and why, among so many other reasons, I love her. Because I have often played a role in the periphery of politics, I have occasionally been asked why I never ran for public office. My response has remained consistent over the years, which that I doubted how well I would handle public criticism. I have learned something very important tonight. Criticism's easy, but prolonged praise is brutal. <laughs> My closest friends are in this room tonight, and they need neither recognition nor accolades from me to know how deeply they touch my soul every day. The capacity, even at this stage of life, to find close and enduring friendships is a surprising and very special gift. Finally, I realize that none of us know what our lasting legacy will in fact be. We just don't get the chance to write our own history. Timing is in the hands of the gods, as I was so painfully reminded this past weekend with the death of a great citizen, philanthropist, and very close friend, Lewis Katz. I wish I could express how much of who I am and how much I owe to a personal gallery of great friends who are no longer with us, among whom are Arlen, Tom, Ed, Bob, Ernie, and now Lewis. Better than I could hope to express, I found some comfort and wisdom in the words of the 20th century Irish Nobel Prize winner, William Butler Yeats, who wrote in his poem, The Municipal Gallery Revisited, as follows. You that would judge me, do not judge me alone. This book or that. Come to this hallowed place where my friend's portraits hang and look thereon. Ireland's history and their lineaments trace. Think, think where man's glory most begins and ends. And say my glory was, I had such friends. Thank you. <laughs>